and uh, Anakin Apple Larsen will begin. So please welcome curator at Ngangry, Anakin Apple Larsen. Thank you. Uh, well, I started October 1st, so I'm quite new at York. So really, it certainly is a, a privilege to stand here getting a chance to reflect uh, on, the, on the ongoing process where the two museums have merged and are in the process finding new ways of interpretation, curating and exhibition urban history in general and locally. Being part of this is so great. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the, today's seminar, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot of you, from you all. Uh, right now, I'll take the opportunity to talk a little about being inclusive, how participation adds value to the museum, and how it makes uh, people feel valued or might even empowered. And it uh, might even add some new values to the museum in society. I'll use some examples um, to try to get a glimpse of what of um, what are the channel challenges we have and the gains we achieve having focus on the audience and by involving the audiences. Uh, example number one is very dear to me uh, as I have been a part of this uh, of its development in the last three years. Historisk Atlas, as it's called, History Map, is a digital project that brings our individual and local history and cultural heritage alive anytime and anywhere. It is a website currently consisting of 49 maps from different periods and places, nearly 48,000, excuse me, nearly 4,800 locations, over 11,000 photos and uh, 43 videos are to be found on the site. 158 institutions are participating and 226 people are actively uploading content on Historisk Atlas. The site is visited daily by five through 600 persons. Participating institutions are archives, libraries, and museums. Uh, the website is easy for the content, pro uh, the content providers to use. It is in constant development with a strong focus on usability. The site is democratic in its thinking in relation to development. The feedback and ideas from the content providers helps to develop the site as well as the end users' demand in relation to their experiences with the site. Historisk, no, excuse me, Historisk Atlas has proven to be a very good place to exhibit the local history. We speak of the very local history, almost from street corner to street corner. The stories which is of particular interest for those who live in the area especially content providers from the small local archives and museums, has been given a platform that might well for the first time allows them in a professional way to present their large amounts of knowledge about the local area to the public. And the slide here I've done, as the Historisk Atlas suggests, uh, I entered my home address, and here is what is right near, uh, um, of great stories right near where I live in Weile. There's no doubt about it that content providers feel that their daily work has been given value. The knowledge has become available to the public. The, the local history presented like this gives the locals plenty of opportunities to explore what's just outside their door. The second example is from here, even uh, Den Gamle By, and it's a fantastic project which was established in 2004 uh, when Den Gamle By launched a program about communicating memories, offering it to elderly and people suffering from dementia to see, see, hear, smell, feel and taste the past. Since then, elderly suffering from dementia has been vis invited to visit Aunt Karen in a house that is furnished as when it, the elderly were children in the 20s, 1920s. The program is all about senses. The scent of the brewed coffee blends in freshly with the freshly baked pancakes, nice homely smells, with, which mingles with the sound of ticking clocks. When the project started, there was, there was certain skepticism and wonder from several parties. 
Why did the museum go into the field that was reserved health care? Should museums now work with treatment of disease? It's not about treating diseases, so, but about the museum reaching out for a specific target group with special needs. The museum established contact with the local social and health services and worked out a partnership uh, develop developing and launching the project. The partnership has proven very successful. Recognizing each partner's different skills, the partnership resulted in a professional program with very high standards. No compromising, and thank you for that. The partnership and program does still exist, and new offers are added. Currently, my colleagues are working very hard on furnishing an apartment from the 1950s. It takes a lot of knowledge and drive organizing a complete apartment where the elderly can explore and every drawer or cupboard. The success is evident. Results from studies made by an external party shows that the elderly experience a significantly better self-esteem in weeks after the visit. This is an example of how we can reach out to specific audiences, providing our museum expertise in relation to audiences that otherwise seems lost to the world. It's about establishing a constructive partnership in which very different disciplines work together and create something new. By reaching out, take, making the museum skills available in other contexts, the museum gain value uh, in other ways besides from our well-known values in interpreting history through exhibition, books, activities, and so on. Okay. My new colleagues, as they are, are very precise about the, the other values that accompany the programs. Uh, when staff, who are specially trained for this work, spurs conversation in, uh, to the elderly person's own memories, they uh, repeatedly experience that person lights up, that the person lights up and displays a pleasure suddenly remembering something. The elderly people show excitement for a moment to escape the embrace of oblivion. It is valuable for the museum to make people's confidence grow. Reaching out to a museum contributing to a citizen groups feeling strengthened in their own lives, this is another way to go when it comes to be a museum for the locals. The example is an ultimate example of reaching out, an example that makes one reflect. Should not everyone experience the feeling that their life has value and been given a sense of being strengthened? What do we as museums have to offer? Last example is Popstad Lund, or Pop Town Lund. Lund is a Swedish town. Um, for <laughs> The example is about citizens searching for and rediscovering their own history from the time when they were young, growing up and formed by the life they lived in town. Returning to the hometown after 30 years, they discover that everything has changed. Nothing is as they remember it. Worst of all, for the group, they weren't able to see or read anything about Lund in the 1970s through the 1990s anywhere. The history were like as a white spot in history writing. They began communicating about the clothing stores, record stores, concert places, clubs, bars, rehearsal rooms, music and bands. They talked about how everything in their life at that time, in one way or the other, had circled around the pop culture of the time and made them who they were today. They started the Facebook group Popstad Lund about the time period 1971-1996 in Lund with the purpose to create a place where people could portray the time period without boundaries, publishing the material they found important and useful in telling their own story. And it worked. Facebook has shown as a great platform for engaging people in collecting knowledge, information, pictures and objects. And it has worked as something, as a connection place, rapidly and without any cost, where the different voices of in the individuals are united in public history writing. One of the results of this project is an exhibition, and it's opening just in the, by the end of the month. The Museum in Lund has since spring uh, 2011 collected items for the exhibition Pop Style Lund. The exhibition will focus on the music scene and popular culture in Lund in the time period. 
and it will be entirely based on the stories, objects, and knowledge that people outside the museum have contributed. Items have been collected in special collection week, weeks and used in Popstalon tour bus uh, that travel around and brought larger items home. The exhibition has not been a goal from the beginning, but somewhere down the line the idea was created and the town museum started facilitating the process. In this case, it's really not that important that there's going to be an exhibition. It's more important that a group of people engage in their own history and even begin to capture it by themselves. The digital social networking makes it easy for them to establish the necessary communication and sense of community that is, is the dynamic of the collection uh, project. The example with Pop Star Lund shows that we as museums do not always need to have the leading role to make people engage and participate. As museums, we are accustomed to that we take the initiative uh, to collection and documentation projects. We decide what issues citizens should work with. We have control over the whole process. But does it always have to be this way? Perhaps we should become better listeners and occasionally take on facilitating role when it comes to working with a city or a local community's history, as they do in Lund. I'll try to sum up. The digital media works in, our, in favor of museums. Social media makes it easy to establish communication and dialogue on many platforms. And people are accustomed to make connections, to be seen and heard, and not at least to contribute their own perspectives to the communication, to make meaning for themselves and their surroundings. But it's a challenge to, for the museums too, communicating a communication has changed. It's no longer primarily one-way communication. We are facing necessary dialogues with all parties likely to be heard and where creation of meaning occurs in, uh, in the processes. It is the user's personal learning and philosophy that determi uh, determines whether they think something is interesting or important. It's not what we think. This is important when we design our communication and interpretation. Uh, of history to or with the audiences. From where I stand, being a successful museum is about letting people feel that they are part of something bigger, that their stories matter and that they are important. Museums can be great places for empowering uh, of people. We need therefore to be engaged in people and involve them, making it possible for them to participate in many ways. Local urban history can be an effective way of getting locals to participate. It's right outside my door. It is about me. This immediate relevance can be a great engine for user involvement. By zooming in on the local history, we reach out to the citizens of the town, inviting them to participate in what matters to them. We need to focus on the processes, establishing the communication with the audience diverse and ongoing. Choice of media must be focused on audience and manifold, depending on the individual's motivation and preferences. At the end of the day, museums are about people. We are here for the people, all of them. And being museum with the people, that's an exciting challenge and a quite complex ta uh, task. But it's fun and meaningful. And we're going to have some very wonderful co discussions here at Den Gamle Bø the coming months. Thank you. Just one technical question. Is it possible to hear what is said? Then it must be because I played rock music in, when I was young that I had some difficulties. I would like to speak about uh, four things uh, relating to what we are working with, thinking about how to make the uh, local history uh, relevant uh, in, our, um, in our preconditions. So I'll talk about the aim, I'll uh, sketch the preconditions and the plans, and then I'll try to focus. It is Den Gamle Bys aim to make history relevant to people. 
and it's once said that uh, the Gamleby wished to be a museum for both the professor and the fool. And we say that we neither run the museum for the past nor for the objects because the past is gone and the objects are dead. No, we make museums for people now and in the future. And everything we do should be based on research and knowledge, but we do not want to appear uh, academic. And we believe that it should be enjoyable to visit museums, and we are convinced that providing museum visitors with a good experience will open up for further reflections and insight, which really is the museum's true objective. We also think that a good cup of coffee and clean visitor facilities can be as important for a pleasant museum experience as exhibitions and living history. And we do not run the museum to earn money, but we believe that earning money is a precondition for improving the museum on an ongoing basis. The preconditions is the framework of museums and their history in Aarhus. And it is also the physical environment and museological concept of Den Gamle By. First to the historical survey of the museums in Aarhus. In 1861, uh, Aarhus Museum, in fact it's 150 years ago, so there's another anniversary uh, this year. Uh, the Aarhus Museum was founded with focus both on archaeology and history. In 1909, Den Gamle By uh, was founded and during the coming years the museum took over the historical part, while the archaeology uh, remained at Aarhus Museum. In 1970, the Aarhus Museum was closed and the uh, Moskau Museum at the Manor House of Moskau took over the archaeology. That meant that no museum after 100 years uh, took the task of exhibiting the whole story of Aarhus seriously. There were no Aarhus exhibition and politically uh, the, the city council and the people of Aarhus began to think about how should we uh, make such an exhibition. That led to the founding of the Aarhus Bi Museum, the City Museum of Aarhus, which took over the history and the storytelling in 1993. And in 2011, uh, the city council realized that this did not work as they wanted it to work, so the city museum was closed and Gamle By was asked to take over both the history and the storytelling. So the storytelling is now an important task for, for the Gamle View. We have several museums in Aarhus. We have an art museum, we have a natural history museum, we have the uh, mentioned Moskva museum with a focus on archaeology, we have the Gamle By, which is both a national museum and now also a local museum, and we have the women's museum, uh, which is a national museum. Consequently, the primary task for Den Gamle By will be to fulfill the express claim for an Aarhus story, covering the period from the city was founded in the Viking period up to present time. And this Aarhus story will have to fit into the framework and concept of Den Gamle By. And now I'll try to give you a, a, an idea of what Den Gamle By is, because it's a very complex museum. It has basically three chronological parts and several museums in the museum. Here you have a map over the museum and you see uh, on the left you see the old part 1718-1800s uh, and then you see the uh, more recent part 1927 and the newest part which is mostly a building site which is from 1974. A brief introduction only with pictures. We also have this living history part, workshops, homes, gardens, and a lot more. In 1927, we are up in modern times with bicycles and shops. And we have cabling, cables in the air. We are so proud of them. And we have a museum that's rather funny. It has been playing with our own identity to make this museum as it was in 1927. Normal visitors 
don't realize that it is a museum in 1927. I don't know why. <laughs> then we have 1974. And this is what it will come to be. The, the houses in the background are built at the moment and uh, the large houses in the front uh, are being built at the moment. Then we have collections and museums inside the museum. We have the Danish Poster Museum, a gallery of decorative arts with clocks and watches, silverware and porcelain and delftware. We have toy museum, we have collections of uh, cloths and uh, textiles and a lot of other things. Just to give you an impression, we have the Poster Museum here, a very modern building, even though it does not look modern from outside. We have the Gallery of Decorative Arts. We have different kinds of clothes. So you could say that the Gamdeby is a sort of Chinese box. You have a sort of time traveling from the 1700s uh, to 1927 to 1974, and we plan to go even further up, but we are not that far at the moment. We have living history parts. We have the museums in the museum. And now we have added a new task of being local museum for Aarhus. So as a museum, you could say that Ngandebu is decentralized, it's diverse, and it's popular. We have usually about, uh, between three and 400,000 visitors per year. And the mission and task of also being a local museum for Aarhus will have to fit into this framework, both the museum structure in Aarhus and the structure of the uh, museum in Gamleby. We have some very preliminary thoughts about the structure for Aarhus history at Den Gamleby. They would probably be different after this day, but now I have to, to, to say what we have thought about at the moment. First, we have a lot of Aarhus at Den Gamleby already. <coughs> then we will have to make a big exhibition of the Aarhus story. We uh, will have facilities for temporary exhibitions and events, and we will have an Aarhus experience. Aarhus is very present at Den Gamleby. The original town plan was inspired, the original town plan of Den Gamleby was inspired by Aarhus historic uh, town plan. And around 20 of the historic buildings come from Aarhus. And the Gamdebu's collections are based on the collections from the old Aarhus Museum, even though they are uh, extended uh, considerably since then. So Aarhus is very present in the layout and content of the Just to give you an idea, this is the old mayor's resident, which in the, in the um, uh, beginning of the 20th century was a worn-out building in the central Aarhus. When the city made a large national exhibition in 1909, you could see the mayor's resident re-erected as it was when it was built in 1597. And here it is uh, translocated as the first house when the opened in 1914. Then there's the old story, a very important task, the exhibition that has been missing in Aarhus for, you could say, 150 years. And it would be missing for some time still because we have not got the money, we have not got the building. We need, we think, three to four hundred square meters for, uh, for this exhibition. And we think of it as, uh, in two parts, a main track and some side tracks. The main track is thought with a time travel from the Viking ages up to the present time. It should be a rather brief exhibition. It should be possible to go through it in 20, 30 minutes. You know, if the mayor has some guests, he could uh, have a quick walk through the time of Aarhus, to the history of Aarhus. Then we will also think of some sidetracks with characteristic Aarhus stories. I will come back to that later with what is characteristic Aarhus stories. Then we need facilities for temporary exhibitions. Then we have transformed uh, exi an existing facility to the Aarhus Galleries with six exhibitions room and a total of about 200 square meters. It was inaugurated with a, a photo exhibition called Aarhus Flashback on September the 3rd this year. In fact, 
the, the idea is we have the facilities, we transform them into an Aarhus-focused uh, area. Then we have thought about making the Aarhus experience to use amusement park technologies to convey a serious history. That's the basic idea, and that's why we call it edu edutainment part. We have uh, in the basement of the new part, which we are building at the moment, we have some very large concrete basements. And in one of these basements, we would make the Aarhus exhibition. At the moment, we have not got the idea of what it should be because the technology is running so fast, so it's very difficult to, to, to now to say what we would make in four or five years. But we have the framework for it, and that's very important. We do not have the money, we hope we get them. And one uh, inspiration could be the Holland Rama at the Netherlands of Luxembourg in Arnhem in Holland. We will also have some focus. And we think that the Viking period, even though it's very important in Danish history, will be exhibited only in summary, because the Moskau Museum <coughs> is expected to cover this period in details. So we'll have to fit into the uh, museum environment in Aarhus. The Middle Ages and the Absolutist period will also only be exhibited in summary, because Den Gamleby as a museum covers this period already. The focus will be on the last 150 years, which is the period where Aarhus has developed to what the city is today. And the primary focus will be on two things. What made Aarhus to Aarhus? And the period and the themes that people re will relate to. We play with a title made in Aarhus. And uh, there's a couple of things mentioned here. The first is the innovative supermarket, which is nationwide at the moment. The first one was uh, founded in Aarhus. The feedback record studio, which is the key to the rock music, which is a sort of parallel to the pop star Lund, because uh, the rock music from, uh, from Aarhus was very famous, in especially the 80s. And the feedback record studio was um, sort of key to, to this period. We have the Emery, which is uh, an old tea room, which is around 100 years old, which was updated uh, uh, 15 years ago and is now nationwide. And nobody knows that it comes from Aarhus. And uh, that's why people around in Denmark say Emerisa, because they think it's an American concept. But it's not, it's from Aarhus. And we have, for instance, the v Women's Museum. We have the Gamleby. We have a lot of Aarhus stories. We'll have, uh, we will have to, to find these stories to put them into the sidetracks of the basic Aarhus story. Another thing uh, which is made in Aarhus is this sign. And here you see the first sketch of the sign, which I expect you, uh, you all know, the No Nuke logo. Uh, I read uh, in, an, uh, in a foreign, I can't remember where it was, but a foreign website, which was in English, that um, this mark, uh, this uh, logo, was made in Copenhagen. And I think it was probably because the only town and city in Denmark that was known to uh, the people who wrote the website was Copenhagen. Now we put it into the Made in Aarhus. Here you have the, uh, the gable painted in 1975. When we think about uh, what we will do, which focus we will have, I very often quote uh, our good colleague Olaf Oros, who is director of the Norwegian Folk Museum in Oslo. And two years ago, he from this stage asked, what is it that interests the visitors more than anything else in the world? And the answer is themselves. And he said, all of us want to be reunited with our own lives, our own history, the toys and cars and video players and jeans and shirts and Walkman that we once had. Our teenage room with posters, Beatles records, CDs and compact cassettes, or Transformers or Little Ponies books. Uh, all these things that once were part of our lives. So the aim for the Aarhus history must be that the museum and the history of Aarhus should be relevant, available and accessible to everybody, even to those who are not really interested in museums and history. And now it's time for Martin.
Here's something I know that's interesting for Thomas, The Who. Out in the street it was a hit by The Who, one of the first hits, but it's also a goal for the Gamleby of a way of being a city museum. Um, the museum, with its exhibitions and facilities, have certain possibilities to telling urban stories, but the public area of the city has other strong qualities. An original museum item uh, can have a special value, but likewise can the original place have a value. The original place, in the original place, there's already built in a context and stories, and we like to use these original places more in the way we are telling the story. I would like to show uh, an example of a project in Gamleby have made um, in the short time. It also been the Museum uh, of Aarhus and also demonstrate another digital project we are working on, where we also use the city maps to uh, perspective uh, the history. It doesn't mean that these uh, two projects were invented from scratch because the staff from the former Museum of Aarhus, now is the staff, also staff members in Gamleby, and of course their most valuable colleagues in the process of, of telling these stories, also in making these two projects I'm, uh, I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about. The last one, uh, the MAP project is in progress, and you're actually some of the first one to hear about it and to see some of the ideas we have, uh, but it'll tell a bit of, about how we want to make the story accessible for, uh, for the public. But the first one I'm going to talk about is Aarhus Street Museum. The idea behind the project is to give location in Aarhus a historical depth. And um, means we are doing it by a historical sites, photographs, information uh, and map where you can locate your own position through uh, GPS. The Aarhus Street Museum is an application which you can use on a iPhone or, uh, or you can use on uh, Android, well you can't see it anyway but it's here. Uh, and outside there's a possibility to download it, we have put up some, uh, some QR codes. Um, well, app is, uh, is the new black in many ways and, um, and you can see that it's a talk of the town and everybody wants one. Yes, we also like to be smart here in Ngamnabi, but the main reason we have chosen to make an app is because it's a reliable way of uh, telling story in situ, uh, to tell stories where it took place. Apps are very easy for the users to download and to install, and at last we have a friendly using program for mobile phone, something which was not as easy just two, three years ago. Through the mobile phone we can communicate cultural history location based and what is the benefit of doing so? It is that it has a direct involvement of the site story, it can stimulate the senses and uh, through it you can have an understanding of history through spatial and interactive experiences. And now I will tell a bit about how it works. I will demonstrate by showing these uh, pictures here. When you turn on the app you can see this uh, map here with, uh, with spots on and you can also uh, see your own position, um, a blue spot, uh, so in that way figure out where, where you are. And each of these red mar uh, spots marks uh, a story and when you turn it on, it's the next picture down here, then you see where, where you are. And when you uh, put on the, click on the mark, then you get a picture of the place where you are and can see how it looked like and then you can also have read some, some more text. Uh, now it is only in, in Danish uh, but we are, I'll return to that later, we are figuring out whether we should do it in, uh, in, uh, in other languages too but also clearly uh, are influenced whether it will be an idea for the tourist and not for the citizens of ours or who's to use a, a, a map like this. The, you can say the use of it is, of course, to, that you have the possibility to compare urban spaces in time. Here is the St. Clemens Cathedral at the main square uh, in Aarhus. Uh, you can see how it looks today and, uh, and how it have, have looked in time, and you can do that in all these, uh, these different locations we have chosen. The application also tells specific stories 
behind uh, the chosen locations. This here is from Guldsmedgade, uh, also in the center of the town, and the picture to the right is from February 1945, um, where there was a terror action made by a Nazi, Nazi sympathizing group, done as a reaction to uh, the resistance movement, also done to uh, unstabilize the public order. The bombing resulted in the vacant building square you can see on, uh, on the top picture to, to the left. And it was here that Vertex, uh, the first uh, Veritex store in Denmark, was, uh, was built. So it's also a, a, a story in itself. Um, all these, not all of them have as complex stories as these, but we are trying to tell through the application the story it, it, it must have. Then Gangby is not the first city museum to have an app like this. We don't have a strategy to be a first mover on the field, but to implement other museums' good idea. And one of them is the uh, Museum of London's Street Museum, where you also, through a map, uh, can get pictures and, and stories. The application from London also have an element of augmented reality, where you, when it works, can see historical picture as a layer in, on the screen of your, your telephone. Another example of, of a museum using this kind of technology is the Powerhouse. There should be asked there. Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, uh, which, where you also have the possibility of, uh, of, of, of getting a guided tour and, and hearing it auditive meanwhile you're wa walking. In Rotterdam and Amsterdam, you can, through an augmented reality layer based app, also see uh, architectural changes in the city. And in Edinburgh, you can see where you are, not on a Google map, but on a historical map. All these applications have inspired us here in the Gamleby, and we are looking at them uh, when we are planning the further works uh, we want to do in, uh, in apps. Because the present form of the uh, All Street Museum is not the final form. Our plan is to keep an eye on what our colleagues are doing, and then also to listen to our users. So we have asked out and we'll do it more thorough in the public to how do they use this app uh, and how can we change it. So we constantly can be changing it and also uh, adding more content, content if is that what is most useful or uh, changing some of the techniques in it so it can be most used. This is meant to be as useful as possible for, uh, for our users. The application of All Street Museum is not a solitude project. When the app was launched on uh, October the 1st, uh, Ngambi also opened the exhibition All Flashback and uh, launched the book All Flashback. It's, you can say the same pictures and the story, but other formats. And the whole idea is, of course, to, uh, to use the different formats as good as possible. The apps tell the story the street, the exhibition, use the spatial and social advantages of the exhibition format, and the book, in the book it's possible to study the chosen locations further. Another project I briefly will mention, yeah it will be briefly, is a historical book called Aarhus. You can say it's a historical map of Aarhus. It's a web-based project, and the main idea is the same as in the Aarhus Street Museum and Aarhus Flashback. You have this map of Aarhus, and let me see if it's functioning. It seems to do. And when you uh, get the map, you can see out here in this side, maybe I should use this one, over here, there are different uh, time periods where you can see pictures from. And when you click at the pictures, then you see the historical picture. It's there. And underneath, you can see a Google Street View, so you we can uh, you can compare it in, in that way with the with the historical picture and then the yeah, the very present uh, Google Street View. This project is not uh, a finished one at all. We're at the moment. Uh, trying it and trying to improve it and also interesting to work together with other museums, archives, institutes who tell urban history through geodata. 
and to get inspired by them how to make a product like this as useful as, as possible. The main purpose with this project and generally in the Gamle by is to make the past alive in the present, which we also have tried to exemplify in a short trailer I will show you now, where some of my colleagues from all the time are getting out in the street in Aarhus. Well, thank you.